This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. So um, those of you who know me know that I speak quickly, so that might work in our favor today. The, this is yet another consequence of the lack of cardiologists since Steve got bumped up to do the cardiology talk. You know what rolls downhill, so I'm here to do the what's new in kidney transplant talk. So, but I'm happy to do it. Is that? box going to go away? Oh, great. Okay. So I think um, I, it's always what's hot, but Napa is pretty hot. So maybe people are more interested in what's cool, um, what's new and what's cool about kidney transplant. So we'll just talk about five papers in 2012 so you can do the countdown and know that you're getting closer. Um, this isn't even a paper. This is just actually work that um, uh, we've just submitted to the American Journal of Transplantation, um, looking at kidneys from less than 20, euro, uh, 20 kilogram pediatric donor. Uh, should we be doing on block or single kidney transplantation? I'm sure many of your patients uh, have had uh, pediatric uh, donor kidneys uh, used for their transplant. And what we tend to do is the smaller the donor, the more we use the on block technique, both for technical and nephron dosing reasons, but of course that takes up two kidneys. So there's this tension between wanting to help two people with single kidney transplants versus a single person with two kidney transplants. So that's what we were interested in looking at. So the first thing that I wanted to show you is that the, these transplants are concentrated in a small number of centers. And what this shows on the x-axis is the number of transplants done in a five and a half year period. And on the y-axis is how many centers are doing them. In the box, you can see about 42% of transplant centers in the country don't do any transplants using kidneys from less than 20 kilogram pediatric donors. And you can see that 17% or 44 do only one to two transplants in a five and a half year period. And therefore, you can see that this is a pretty highly concentrated activity. Uh, for the future slides, I just wanted to tell you that a center that does more than five in the five and a half year period, so that's 36 plus 36, those are going to be considered high volume centers, and those who do five or less are going to be considered low volume centers because we should take a look at outcomes relative to center volume. So the first thing is, and this might be intuitive, that is that across the entire weight spectrum, giving somebody two kidneys yields better one-year graft survival outcomes than giving them a single kidney. I'm limiting it to one-year graft survival because that's when the technical issues of these t challenging transplants come into play. As I think you can imagine, the two kidney option is going to do better in the long run because there's two kidneys involved. So again, this is one-year survival. Now, if we look at large versus small volume centers, what you can see is that um, the small volume centers, the two lower curves, have really suboptimal outcomes for both single and on block transplants at the lower weight range. On the other hand, if you look at large volume centers, it looks pretty darn good for the entire weight range. And so I think that this slide is trying to tell you that we can all get as a community more bang for our kidney buck if these practices continue where more experienced centers are using these kidneys and using their best judgments about when to split the kidneys into on block versus single kidney transplants. 
And so this is the UCSF experience. We've done 116 transplants in 20 years and a few months, so I think we can just round it down to 20 years. And what you can see is our one-year graft survival is more than 90%. Our five-year graft survival is about 88% or so, and our 10-year graft survival is about 78, 79%. And I think Rio statistics show that for a standard criteria donor kidney transplant, five your graft survival is in the mid 70%. So these kidneys are giving us 10 year graft survival of 78% or so. So these are outstanding kidneys if we can sustain that early technical graft loss early on. So UCSF is certainly considered a high volume center in terms of using these kidneys and we're doing well by your patients in doing so. So let's switch gears to DCD versus DBD kidneys. I think this is an interesting paper that came out in The Lancet. It's a UK registry study, uh, basically looking at, so registry retrospective, this is what happened, this isn't dictating what is going to happen. Uh, at all kidney transplants that are primary adult uh, kidney transplants in a five plus year period, there are about 6,500 transplants, and of those 1,800 or so were DCD, and 4,100 were brain dead donors. So DCD donors were comparable in age to the DBD donors, but Again, because of these large numbers, there were statistical differences, many of which were not really clinically significant. But they tended to be more male, more white, more smokers, died more often of trauma and other causes, and had slightly lower creatinine. In the British units, it was 76 to 78, so it's very, very small difference. DCD recipients were older, more male, less well-matched, less sensitized, and differed somewhat in the etiology of liver disease. Again, this is a retrospective registry study, so it's not surprising that there are some differences in the groups. DCD transplants had shorter cold ischemia time, 14 compared to 16 hours, and a higher proportion of pulsatile perfusion. In England, 24% of the cardiac death donors had pulsatile perfusion, whereas less than 1% of the brain dead donors have pulsatile perfusion. The alternative to pulsatile perfusion is what we do, we put it in a cooler. So what was the take home messages from this study? First of all, DBD and DCD kidneys have equivalent three year graph outcomes stratified by donor age. So the red line is less than 40 year old donors, the blue line is 40 to 59 year old donors, and the green line is greater than 60 year old donors. So this is what we've been what we know here in the United States, it's evident in the United Kingdom, that the mode of death brain death versus cardiac death does not affect long-term outcomes. This is the reason that we don't make people sign a special consent form to receive a DCD kidney because their outcomes are equivalent. The opposite is true in liver transplant because there is a survival decrement, but there is no survival impact for DCD death compared to brain death. However, DCD kidneys do have higher rates of DGF. There was a slightly higher rate of primary non-function, 4% to 3%, statistically significant, again, because of the huge numbers. But DGF occurred in 49% of circulatory death donors and only 24% of brain dead donors. Uh, there was really no significant difference in acute rejection. There was a little difference in 12 month GFR, a little difference in uh, some of the other factors, but the key is there is more DGF. The mach machine perfusion did not improve graft survival, but did reduce DGF with an odds ratio of 0.67. We don't pump kidneys here, so just for your information. The one other fact that came out from the study was that DCD kidneys are more susceptible to long cold ischemia times, greater than 24 hours. I would be hard pressed to think of any DCD kidney that we've ever used at UCSF which would have a 24 hour cold ischemia time. But suffice it to say that basically you can see that the purple line which is the greater than 24 hour cold ischemia time has a 
significantly inferior outcome compared to the other lines and compared to the brain dead donor. And this is expressed as the fact that there is an interaction between outcome and cold ischemia time for uh, the circulatory death donors. Now we're on to three, so we have three more to go. Deriving a biomarker of acute rejection, Minnie Sarwal uh, was at uh, Stanford and now she's at uh, California Pacific Medical Center. She's really been uh, leading the charge in terms of de de deriving a biomarker for acute rejection. So the idea is, as you can imagine, wouldn't it be great if we could diagnose acute rejection with a blood test rather than a kidney poke? And wouldn't it be great if this biomarker might even be able to allow us to assess whether our therapy was working, maybe the biomarker would be evident earlier than any functional change would be the precipitant of um, a biopsy. So this is, there's two slides, we don't really have to go through the details, but suffice it to say that it's a very, very rigorous pattern of trying to look for, identify the biomarker first, derive it, then uh, uh, verify it, and then validate it, and then test it. So the, the, uh, um, the key was, was that she had a total of, I think, 367 paired blood and biopsy samples so that we know exactly what was going on in the kidney at the same time as when the blood was drawn. So this is the schematic for how this work is done. You first take a subset of the specimens that you have. You run it on three microarray platforms to look for these genes. This is sort of the discovery phase. That discovery phase identified 32 genes which seem to be worthwhile to test further. You then take that into a more validation uh, uh, phase where um, you take the 32 uh, discovery genes and you take a second set of specimens, a verification specimens, that then led you, uh, can allow you to whittle down the number of genes down to a five gene set. And this five gene set ends up being locked in uh, uh, by uh, the logistic regression model and then separately tested with a separate set of specimens. So these are the five genes. Three of them are actually uh, increased in those who are rejecting the three in the red box, and two of them are actually decreased in the patients who are rejecting. And you can see the performance of these five genes individually in the single center verification set, as well as in the single center validation set. So what are these five genes? They actually kind of make biologic sense, which is also always reassuring. They're involved in leukocyte trafficking and TMB cell activation. They're expressed by activated monocytes in the peripheral circulation reflecting uh, tissue injury, and these are the five genes. So how well do they predict? Let me give you a sense. The red um, dots are acute rejection specimens. The green dots are stable specimens, basically normal normal histology, all read by a central pathologist. The x-axis is time after transplant. And what you can see is the gene set defines a threshold which reflects the probability of acute rejection. Anything above the dotted line is classified as rejection. Anything below the dotted line is classified as not rejection. So you can see that there are three red dot miscalculations. Uh, ca classifications down at the bottom and six green dot miscal uh, classifications up at the top with really good overall accuracy and you can see that the area under the curve is extremely high 0.955. You can argue that this is probably is as good as a biopsy because we all know biopsies are also subject to sampling error. They also looked at the acute rejection specimens along with uh, 72 biopsies that were neither rejection by BAMF, 
nor normal. And the diagnoses of these other specimens included chronic algraft nephropathy, CNI toxicity, borderline acute rejection, and other BK virus and just other stuff. And what they showed, first of all, interestingly, is if you focus on the pink dots, which are the borderline acute rejection, eight of the 12 are classified as rejection and four are classified as non-rejection. And that's reassuring because probably some of those people may be on their way to full-blown rejection. And they dominate that upper part of the prediction uh, uh, graph. And you can also see that, again, the AUC for distinguishing acute rejection against all of these other four Motley diagnoses was really quite high. Finally, this is stuff that uh, Minnie has sent to us uh, uh, kindly, which is also under review. They've taken 126 blood samples from heart allograft recipients, which are also biopsy matched. And basically, the same genes seem to be able to identify heart transplant recipients who are undergoing rejection. So what you can see is that the asterisks identify the misclassified samples, which are relatively few and far between. And so they have a manuscript that's under review reporting these findings, and they have a second manuscript that looks at um, that the fact that this uh, solid organ rejection test, or SORT, uh, appears to be a common immune mo um, a module for cellular and humoral graft rejection in all solid organ transplants because they're also looking at lung and intestinal rejection. So I think this is uh, stuff that may really be able to help us down the road in terms of a non-invasive biomarker of rejection. Okay, skin cancer. Um, this is the molecule uh, serolimus on the left and this is the classic squamous cell cancer on the right. And so in the New England Journal in 2012, there was this uh, article, Serolimus and Secondary Skin Cancer Prevention in Kidney Transplantation. So this is a secondary prevention study. So these 129 patients all had a skin cancer. They're all post-transplant, post-kidney transplant patients. They were then randomized to get either serolimus or CNI uh, continuation. Um, and basically what you can see is, uh, is the uh, constant or diagram as to the patients who were followed. And what did this trial show? Well, first of all, you can see that in the, sero the serolimus bar is up at the top and this continued CNI uh, bar is at the bottom. And the y-axis is the probability of, of freedom from a second or a subsequent skin cancer. So clearly, serolimus had a statistically significant impact on preventing the next skin cancer. The ratio also of squamous to basal cell uh, dropped because one of the unusual factors about post-transplant skin cancer is that there's this tremendous predominance of squamous cell and that seemed to be modulated also by the serolimus therapy. And But the caveat is all serolimus patients had one or more adverse events related to the study drug. 23% had to stop the study drug in two and a half months, and there were bad events associated with a quick conversion from the CNI to the serolimus. So I think the only thing I would say about this is there is another drug that is approved for prevention of rejection in kidney transplantation in the same class called everolimus. It's a BID dosing drug, whereas serolimus is a QDA dosing drug, therefore it has a much shorter half-life, and I think it would be an interesting uh, uh, question as to whether the everolimus might actually be better tolerated, which is what I think we're observing in both the kidney and the liver transplant population. And one more uh, slide on this is that this actually, uh, the serolimus worked incredibly well. As you can see, it was perfect for people who had a single squamous cell carcinoma, but it worked less well and actually did not meet statistical significance if people entered the trial with more than one uh, squamous cell carcinoma in their history. Although I think there's still an effect, but I'm sure the numbers, uh, this is becoming a numbers game. 
So finally, I think I'm going to close this with the perennial question, should we be doing transplant nephrectomies or should we not? So I think when a transplant fails, we're all in this room too familiar with all the sequelae of the failed transplant. Presumably there's some sort of rejection process, although one could think that the kidney is just senescent and wore out. Um, dialysis has to start. People become quite anemic. They may get transfusions. We slow or stop or wean their immunosuppression. The weaning and stopping of immunosuppression may precipitate acute rejection, and then what do you have? Should we be doing the transplant nephrectomy? I think one of the biggest concerns is does transplant nephrectomy and or all of these other intervening events contribute to allosensitization, the development of alloantibodies that might hinder the next transplant. So that's really, I think, the key factor. In addition, there's also the potential of complications related to the transplant nephrectomy, which might include bleeding, more transfusions, uh, vascular injury, infection, et cetera, et cetera. So, I think we all suspected that perhaps transplant uh, nephrectomy would increase allosensitization because having the kidney there might provide a sink. It might soak up the alloantibodies that are being produced uh, by the immune system. On the other hand, I think there's also suspicion that just stopping or slowing the immunosuppression or reducing the immunosuppression may precipitate alloantibody development. And I think this was shown in uh, after failed islet transplant when 98% who received 191 islet transfusion uh, eyelid infusions, if you look at people who were on immunosuppression versus off immunosuppression, you can see that there was a tremendous increase in the median and in uh, of uh, class one and class two sensitization with stopping immunosuppression after eyelid transplantation. So there was a very good uh, study uh, that was published in C. Jason in 2012. They looked at 95 patients, all of whom had graft loss, and six, they ended up stopping all immunosuppression within six months of starting dialysis. 21 of those patients did not have a transplant nephrectomy, and 74 of them did but they did not include those who had a very, very early transplant nephrectomy within three months of transplantation. Now, they had some sort of protocol at this center where they just took out kidneys systematically, so that's the 17 systematic versus the 31 indicated transplant nephrectomies, presumably because of pain, graft swelling, hematuria, and the usual symptoms. So in total, there were 48 people who had nephrectomies and 21 people who did not, and th those will be the subject of the final slides. So what you can see is with a class one graph on the left and a class two graph on the right, you can see that the prevalence of alloantibodies was quite low at the time of graft loss, the very low bars in each graph. However, at last follow-up, you can see that there was a substantial increase in um, alloantibodies. And the dark bars, the patients who got the transplant nephrectomy, had much more alloantibodies, uh, or m many more of those patients had alloantibodies than the shaded bar, those people who maintained their graft. Now, you might ask, well, when do these alloantibodies show up? And so they have a longitudinal data. And so again, if you look from the left, uh, it is a graph loss. And the difference between uh, the top and the bottom, again, is just class class one and class two, I believe. So suffice it to say that, again, the lower bars on the left are at the time of graph loss. And at the second set of bars is when the graft nephrectomy happened. So there is some increase associated with discontinuing the immunosuppression medications. That's the delta from the first set of bars to the second set of bars. But what's really interesting is that at the time of graft nephrectomy, you can see the uh, alloantibody frequency. Within five days after removing the kidney, you can see there's a substantial increase in the prevalence of alloantibodies. So this data, the kinetics of the appearance of alloantibodies suggests that the kidney may indeed have been absorbing 
aloe antibodies such that they were not detectable in the peripheral circulation because of this relatively rapid increase within five days of the transplant nephrectomy. And then you can see basically it's three months post graft nephrectomy uh, and additional time pass and the, the aloe antibodies plateau. So I think that that's, that's all I have to say. I, it's hard to sum up uh, five different papers in five different areas. Um, I hope that this is some, of some interest and uh, there will hopefully be more exciting, hot and cold new things in transplantation to tell you about next year. Yes, because basically you can see that um, the majority of patients become sensitized. And if you're sensitized, and these are donor-specific alloantibodies, then it's going to be much, much more difficult to find a matching or suitable second uh, uh, donor. Well, I think we, we don't know the answer to that. Obviously, it's hard to want to continue immunosuppression over time to maintain something that's not working in the hopes that then you improve chances for the next transplant because who knows when the next transplant is going to be. Therefore, I'm not sure that this is um, strong uh, uh, evidence to continue immunosuppression. On the other hand, I think we don't want to be too aggressive in making the decision to remove transplanted kidneys uh, if they were indeed to act up. So I think there needs to be a balanced approach can I ask a question? How about giving these patients rituximab if you plan to do a transplant effectively? Some drug company might have planted that great idea, but uh, I don't think we could really justify that either. I mean, it, you know, I think lowering immunosuppression definitely results in the emergence of donor-specific antibodies. You know, my whole life, research-wise, is to take people liver transplant recipients off of immunosuppression. And we see that people, as you lower their immunosuppression, the alloantibodies emerge. But I think the key point here is it's clear because there's so many things going on all at the same time, the transfusions, the alloantibodies, you know, uh, changing the immunosuppression. Clearly, ne the nephrectomy has a direct impact on the alloantibodies. That's what's nice about this study.